um, Abigail, she could sit here if she likes, or she could sit there. And uh, Samantha Brennan, um, and we will keep you there. No, we no, you want you want to sit over there? Yeah, okay, then. all right. Please introduce yourself for the record. I'm Samantha Brennan. I'm Abby Owens. Okay. Which one of you ladies would like to go first? All right. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for having us here today. Um, it means a lot to be invited. Um, I'm very nervous. I didn't really want to have to do this, um, so okay. bear with me. Um, but. Like I said, my name's Abby Owens. Um, I was raped by Darius Geis um, at LSU in 2016. Um, this is, today's the first day that I'm publicly disclosing my identity um, because it's super important to me um, what you guys are doing and I wanted to be here and um, yeah, so. Um, after, after I was raped, I went into like a very dark spiral with drugs and alcohol, um, depression, um, isolation, and about 10 months later, I ended up in rehab. Um, and when I was in rehab, I disclosed to my counselor um, and, and the people there like what had happened. I had never told anyone. Um, I was scared. Um, I blamed myself. Like we, you guys were talking earlier about the culture at LSU, um, I was very much like I was like, oh, this was my fault. Like I got too drunk. Like I always kind of like in my head was like he took advantage of the situation, but like it was kind of my fault. Um, and I think that's due partially. Like I think that's due to the culture at LSU. Um, but I was also because of who he was. I was scared to say anything. I think when I first told my counselor, I didn't even say his name because I was terrified. Um, and so after, after I told my counselor, they advised me to tell my parents, and um, so I did, and my dad went to the SEC tournament. I, I played tennis at LSU, I was a student athlete, because um, he already had tickets because I was supposed to be there. And he um, had a meeting with Julia Sell, who's the head tennis coach. Um, and he told her that I was raped by a football player at LSU, and her response to him was, I don't believe her, she's a liar. And they didn't even tell me about this interaction for like a couple weeks, because I was trying to get sober, I was in inpatient rehab. Um, but when, when they told me, I will never forget how I felt because it was like everything that I thought would happen if I were to tell someone was happening. I wasn't going to be believed. Um, and so I decided I, I had 18 credit hours left at LSU. I was about to graduate and I was like, I'm not going back there because um, they were going to keep me on scholarship. Um, but I, I left. I, I felt so unappreciated, unvalued. I, was scared to be there. I felt unsafe, unprotected. Um, and so I left. Um, and then in 2019, I got a call from a reporter. Um, and I guess somehow I'm not clear on how, but she found out about what happened. And so I um, was talking to her and she said, did you ever, um, did you file a Title IX report? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Um, and so I called the Title IX office and I asked her if there was um, a report on me and she said, there's no report, but there's a mention that something may have happened to you. That's all that she said. Um, and so from my understanding now that the Hush, Hush however you pronounce it, Blackwell report came out, um, is that Julia reported it to Miriam and then Miriam didn't put it in some system that she was supposed to and then they said something might have happened. And I know Julia Sell also lied and said that my dad said that they were exploring the possibility 
that I was raped, not that I had said explicitly I was raped. Um, so, yeah, I just, I think it's just another example of LSU, the LSU system failing us. Um, and it makes me mad to think about all the other victims that came after me and Sam, because this was in 2016, and he clearly just escalated after that. Um, and it could have been prevented if they had properly investigated and done what they were supposed to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll take any questions if you have them, but that's it. Thank you. We're going to hear from Ms. Brennan. Thank you so much for your bravery. Thank you for being here. Thank you for me as well for inviting us and having us here and giving this opportunity to speak. Uh, it was very last minute to arrange flights. We don't live here anymore. We came from opposite coast to be here, but we are so glad that we are here and in person and able to do this. I went to LSU 2016 as well. Um, I did not know Abby before this situation, but she and I have become very close and we found out our uh, instances of Darius Geis were just weeks apart. And I was notified from a coworker walking in to work, I worked for the football operations as well, that a nude photo of me was going around the football team. And I knew that there was only one person that could have had that photo, which was Darius Geis. And I immediately went into my boss, Sharon Lewis's office, and told her about it. And she brought in Miriam Seeger, who we've all heard, did one of the ones that was suspended. I still have text messages from Miriam Seeger from this day. I have all of my text messages from this time. Um, and I was able to go through and I did thank her for everything that day, the day I went to the police. And they, Sharon Lewis and Miriam did encourage me to go to LSUPD, which I did do. I filed a report, but I did not press charges. I didn't want to ruin this guy's life. I thought it was a one-time mistake. Lo and behold, it was obviously not a one-time thing. And I remember Sharon Lewis asking me if, they, if I want to report this officially or handle it unofficially. And that is a lot of pressure for a 19-year-old. They gave me Darius Geis's life in my hands. As a 19-year-old, I felt. And I could not risk you know, knowing that I possibly ruined someone's life. And so I let it be and I continued out at LSU for a while until um, Darius became more prominent on the football team. And I could not sit and listen to 100,000 screaming fans cheer him on on Saturday nights. And I dropped out and moved to Hawaii and put Louisiana and everyone here behind me until August when Abby's story came out and it was brought to my attention. And I reached out to the reporters and they have been really helpful in trying to get a lot for me. I am currently in a lawsuit with Thomas Galligan as the official capacity holder of all the public records. I am fighting to get my police report. Um, Judge Janice Clark did say that I was entitled to it and she ruled in our favor, but LSU appealed and we still have not received the entire thing. They did give us um, part of the they gave us the report, but redacted. And when I was first going through all of this, I called LSU PD myself. The day that that article dropped in August, I talked to a desk sergeant, it was after hours. I gave her my birth date name and she was able to find the report. So I called back, talk to Teresa Griffin the next day, she'll help you. When I called at eight in the morning, talked to Teresa Griffin, I gave her my information and since she said, we're having trouble finding your report, let me call you back. She never called me back. I called her two times a day, left her messages, never got a response back until I had the idea that maybe she was screening her phone calls. And I used my fiance's phone number, California number to call and she picked up on the first ring. That was a big slap in the face knowing that they are going out of their way to not give me my own public record and police report. Um, and they have not made it easy for me trying to obtain that. Um, the initial report I was given was four sentences long, no names, and missing the felony part of the crime. 
It was just that he had taken a picture. They did not disclose that he had sent it around. Taking the picture is just a misdemeanor. Sending it is a felony in Louisiana, from what I'm being told. Um, so we are still doing that. And then this Hush Blackwell report came out. And this is 268 pages of crap to me. I read my part in it the day it came out on Friday, and I felt more victimized by this report than anything else thus far. Again, they kept out the fact that the picture was distributed. And I gave him, I gave Scott Schneider all of my text messages, and the only text message that he chose to use was the one that said that I thought Sharon Lewis did what she could to help me and encourage me. But that message was sent in 2017 before any of this came out. So I have text messages from other people in the office saying that all of the higher-ups knew and that they weren't legally allowed to talk to me. They were not allowed to talk to me, Darius and this other, play, um, other worker involved. They, again, tried to just see what I was going to do, and they never reached out. I was never contacted by the Title IX office. I didn't even know that there was anything involved in the Title IX office with my name in it until this report. But again, like there are screenshots of text messages of emails in their support, but not mine. It's just blurbs from emails and from text messages. They cherry picked what benefited them and omitted everything that was damaging to them in at least my section. So I just hope that you guys can take consideration in knowing that this is bad, but the full story is way worse. And they did not put all of it out there. That is so discouraging that we, we think that we are reading the, the real deal and then we find out that it's not really the real deal. Not for me, at least. I'm, not I've, for a lot of the women. I've talked for, to from what I've heard. a lot of us. And I mean, just so many little facts, too. They've misquoted a bunch of us in it. Um, they can't even spell one of the other victims' names right. It's little stuff like that, but it, this is personal to us. And if you can't even give us the respect to spell our names right and quote us correctly, then why, like, this is a record that all of you are reading and thinking that it's the truth, but it's not quite. Representative Davis, you have a question? Thank you, Chairman. Um, again, I, I reiterate what the committee has already said. I'm so deeply sorry. I cannot even imagine what you have gone through like I said earlier, with the assault itself, but now what seems like a cover-up. Um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for shedding light on this. My question earlier, I'm going to take this off since I'm six feet apart, um, is what is the status of those employees that you reported to? Are they still employed with LSU? Sharon Lewis, Miriam, oh, Miriam Seeger, we talked about her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kiva? Hi, Khalees again. Um, so Sharon Lewis and Kiva, actually, even after I won my Title IX investigation in 2018, um, since then, Sharon has actually been promoted. So not only did she not receive any repercussions, she has been promoted. Um, and Kiva also still works in the office i'm not sure if she's in the same building or the same position or if she's been promoted as well but they both have not been involved in any of the consequences so do you think that's appropriate absolutely not i'm uh, sorry i was I, i'm sorry and you're not here i apologize <laughs> i completely I, I understand that i'm looking at president galligan i'm so sorry I think Sh Sharon actually was the only person up to now ever to have been found to have violated uh, um, Title IX, um, and 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 I I will I, w I don't know about Kiva. I will look into the Kiva situation. Um, I would I would also say we want to know. Well, first let me say to everybody, all the all the the survivors that I'm I'm very sorry. Um, and I offer my apology personally and, and on behalf of LSU. And I, I want to thank you again, as, as, as the panel has, for your courage for coming forward. We, we, we wouldn't be in a position to do anything about this if you hadn't come forward. So I appreciate that very much. And I, for one, want to know 
Hush, Hush, we hired Hush Black where we said go and do it, and I think I want to know, and the community wants to know, and I bet Hush Black will wants to know the places where you think something didn't come, didn't wasn't right, or, or there's an error, something's not clear. We want, we want to, we need to know, we need to know about those things. And I appreciate you addressing the victims and apologizing. Again, I think actions speak louder than words in these situations. Um, and I think that the response here of LSU is extremely important because you said something that really, I think, shocked the committee more than anything. You said you wanted to protect, it was it Mr. Geis? But what about you? And I think that if we have a culture here where people are not held accountable and there are no consequences, then victims feel like they can't come forward and you feel like I am, I'm doing something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. So again, I go back to consequences matter and actions matter. I appreciate the apologies, but something has got to give here. Something's got to give. And I hope that the, um, the guy from Blackwell is, and I'm not going to say the first, uh, is it Hush? Hush, Hush. Hush Blackwell is Hush still on the nine. line. I would, uh, did, did they interview you for this? So I'm hoping he can address um, your comments and specifically why were um, parts of your um, testimony not in that report? Is he still on the line? Mrs. Snyder, are you yes. still on the line? Yes, I am. Thank I you. I am still here, yes. Can you address that? Did you hear the question? Yeah. Um, tell me, I'm sorry, repeat the question very quickly. I'm just curious as to why some of the testimony from the um, victims here were left out of the report. Yeah, we tried to be as comprehensive as humanly possible. Um, we met with um, a number of witnesses. I mean, the 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 length of the report I think speaks for itself. I mean, it's 147 pages, um, and we tried to include every bit of information that we thought was important. Uh, with all due respect, sir, we're talking about sexual assault, so I don't think any report can be too long. Yeah, well, um, and I, I feel pretty I, uncomfortable that we included a ton of detail in the report about these incidents. But I think it's giving us a skewed um, view of what may have actually occurred. Um, yeah, we it, tried. It's, this is, it's we, concerning. We, we, well, and I, what I would say is in doing this review, um, we talked to a lot of people and there are other sides to the story and we tried to capture the nuance as well. Would you like to respond or you're good? Yeah, I don't really have yeah. too much else to say to him. I, mean, I, I did trust Scott. I, I thought he was gonna do the right thing. Our lawyer thought so too. So I was extremely, extremely disappointed to, to read this on Friday. Um, yeah, it, that was the thing that broke me. And I'm sorry that you had to relive that. I know you relive it every day in your mind and in your, in your heart and your parents relive it. I, I, again, I cannot even imagine what your, you, you or your parents have gone through, but um, now you're having to relive it in, in, a, in a different way because now you're having to defend yourself. Yeah. And I'm sorry for that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Can I briefly speak to that? Yes, um, please, sir. Yeah, I mean, we, if you read the report um, in both of those, the instance that Abby in particular um, spoke to, I do find her father's account, it's in the report um, about the conversation with Julia Sell to be a credible account. Um, we did mention, we did specifically say in the report um, as well, that um, the incident was reported to Julia Sell and then reported from Julia Sell to Miriam Seeger. Um, and that, that ultimately was reported to the Title IX coordinator. And in doing so, we also pointed out that the Title IX coordinator erred in not following up on that. The university erred in not following up on that. Um, so I, I, you know, I, for, for all intents, I, I completely agree at this point 
and did in the report about Abby's account of, of what happened and Abby's father's account of what happened. Yeah, I, I was speaking on behalf of other women who aren't here to speak for themselves. I didn't find any issue with my own, but I know basically everyone else did, which is why I spoke up, because I've spoken to a well, lot of women. Yeah, and I, it was heartbreaking for me. Um, I tried, and we tried our best um, to capture um, everything and to get there are multiple sides to this. Um, and to lay it out um, as truthfully and as honestly um, as, as we possibly could. And any, there's no punch was um, pulled by me. If there, and if there are things we should have included more, uh, I apologize for that. Um, we tried to err on the side of being comprehensive and giving the other side of, 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 of the, the story. I, I, I will say, the number of instances where we say the university aired speaks for itself. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Um, my, my other question for, for the young man that testified, um, you, you mentioned it was a faculty member. No, it was a student. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. And, and is that student still at LSU? Do you know? LSU system. The LSU system. So he was allowed to go elsewhere. What, can, we, can you come back? Because oh, we can't hear. So I think it's really important that we hear that. Yes, what was the what was the question? I was just curious if the student was still an LSU student. Um, no. Um, okay. Graduated after um, and then attends another university within the system. And someone mentioned that another one of the young men accused is now at a different university? Uh, yes, and I received several text messages uh, text messages uh, because they said that he was at Southern University. He is no longer at Southern University. He actually um, dropped out of Stop Coming in 2020. Was he asked to leave by the university or did he do it? I'm just curious. They, 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 I asked that question. They said he just did not show back up. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Representative Davis. Um, I think that may be all for you, maybe. Oh, oh no, no, for Mr. Bryant? Oh, Mr. Bryant, okay, I'm sorry, please stay. Representative Fiberg. After listening to y'all's testimony, I, I, it took me back to your testimony because we've heard so much about the LSU athletes. Uh, your situation is different and, and it really caught my attention and it may be just a piece of the document that I didn't read, but did the report uh, Hush Blackwell did, did it talk about cases such as yours uh, and not just specifically the athletic department? So there were cases of uh, male sexual abuse. Uh, of, um. Personally, uh, my none of my experiences are in the Hush Blackwell report. I didn't want any part of it. Um, but uh, but are similar. There, I, I don't. Cases I'm not two sure. years in it. I'm not sure if there's any male. If, like, can someone answer that question for me? I, I can speak okay. briefly to it. Right. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we did do um, is we were provided with a number of files. Um, of other cases, and there's a section in our report um, without going into great detail because it, I think it was something in the vicinity of, of 60 cases. What we say in the report were the problems that we see in the processing of other complaints. We're seeing over and over again in a, a variety of, of other, other reports as well. I mean, both in terms of uh, mandatory re recording, not uh, appropriate communication, not a lot of follow-up, um, sort of mediocre, uh, not really strenuous discipline. And so we, we do talk about that um, in the report. We also made time, I want to say, for around 30 focus groups. And um, these issues came up in those as well, and we highlighted that in the report as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Representative Viber. Um, Senator, Senator Peterson. Sorry. I, oh, okay. Sorry, oh. no, I'm not there, but if I could add a comment whenever um, there's a spot, would be appreciated. Say that again. Um, oh. If it's possible to add a comment whenever. Yes, would you please? Who, uh, there's who, time. Is this Jada? Oh, uh, Jade. 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 Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Um, I just want to add that when Scott mentioned about the report, um, there was an incident in there where Drake abused another student athlete, which obviously it's kind of been out there that if he does it again, he goes to jail for five years, and he's done it to another female in um, 2019, I believe, and then now another one in November of, 20, uh, November of 2019 also. So this female uh, made a comment to me at, outside of Tigerland, and she then gave me a black eye. And it's written in the report, which I had no idea, like, that was, you know, going to be a part of it. But I never got asked one time about that incident by the, um, by the lawyers. And I have video of her saying she hit me in the face. I obviously have multiple pictures of my black eye and I, you know, presented all of that to Miriam, which then got passed on to, I believe, Jonathan Sanders with Title IX, who I got put on one year academic probation for doing absolutely nothing. Sure, there's two sides to the story, but I had pictures, I had proof of, you know, her saying she hit me on a video and all of this, but the main point is, no one ever asked me in the report. And then in the report, it said that uh, they couldn't find out the, uh, co like what con consequences got served. And it's, it's right there that I got put on one year probation when I did absolutely nothing. And like, you know, so that was just all cover. I didn't get asked about it. And that was just like an absolute lie. Just retaliation. Mm hmm Okay. Thank you for adding that. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Mr. Galligan to sit back there. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bryan. Um, thank you, ladies, for your t No, I'm sorry. I, mean, I have um, Senator Peterson and Representative Edmiston and Senator Mazel. Senator Peterson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, thank you, ladies, for your courage. Uh, um, I just want to ask Mr. Uh, President Galligan, um, are you still conflicted? Senator, I'm not. I'm. I'm. I've never been conflicted that we need to do a heck of a lot to change, and that this is a tr tremendous institutional failure. Are you still conflicted about the uh, accountability? Because that was the thing about retroactive, because certain rules weren't in our policies weren't in place in place and so you felt like the 21 day and the 30 day and is can you tell me exactly miriam right is there, miriam which one is she miriam is, is 20 21 days when did it start it started friday this past friday yes okay. and so when she leaves for 21 days she gets to reflect and meditate and and take training and take great and then uh she comes back you know, late March, and then she comes back. She's been trained now. And what about what about these ladies and their stories? So you conflicted about whether she should be at LSU in a trusting position. Forget all the regulations. Forget the policies. She listened to stories and ignored them. Like, that fundamentally is where my conflict is with you right now. I, I appreciate that. No, I don't know if you do. No, I do. I appreciate that. Um, and I hear it. And uh, but you're not, don't listen to me. I'm not listening listen to all these I'm stories. I'm looking at you. I'm listening to them. But what, what's the problem then? Like, be you talking about leadership. Lead. I'm not. I, I, need, I need time to process. This, that's what's phenomenal to me. You're at the, you know, there's a reason they call it the flagship. It waves high above all others. It's supposed to. It's not waving very high right now. It's embarrassing. 
It's made most of us cry already. Well, I, I think we've, we've all cried today. Um, and, and I don't want to, well. I, what you got to no process? One, Tell me what you have to process. I still have to process. I mean, I'm seven, hour, seven hours in process. I, I still have to process. To me, I have to process what's fair to, to everybody. To who? Fair to who? To everybody involved. No. See, that's where you're wrong. We have to be fair to the people who have been abused. That's our job. As a leader, we have to take care of those that have been disadvantaged, those that have been wrong, those that have been abused. That's what our job is. We don't have to protect the powerful. And that's what the problem is around here. We, in this building, in other buildings, in institutions, we have always tried to protect the people who are in power. And the little man and the little girl and the people that are powerless don't get a voice because of us. And I'm putting myself in that position. And I'm not going to leave here. If we have to stay another six hours, let's talk about it until you no longer have a conflict. Well, Senator, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to decide based on this afternoon Okay. Without thinking to just fire someone. If I were to do that, I would fire myself. Well, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. If you are so conflicted based on what you heard today, that not just these two ladies, the ladies th that traveled here, that traveled here, on, yeah, having left Louisiana, having been in pain, having been wronged, if you are still conflicted after all of this, Maybe you might have the wrong gig. Well, there are a lot of people I wish I could fire. And and whether I... You whether, don't feel like you have the power to fire them? I feel I have the power to fire them if, if, if I were to decide to fire them. I think there, 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 there are people who think it would be unfair to fire them because of the things that we discussed Who before. thinks that? So you don't think it necessary. You say there are no, people. No, I, I, I think it too, or else I would have, I would have said fire them. I, we've discussed, we discussed this previously. We've discussed why, why I didn't fire them. We, we discussed those reasons. We discussed the fact that the policies were unclear. And I know you keep telling me, oh, the policies, the policies, but the policies were unclear. We discussed the fact that the head football coach, allegedly, I want to protect myself from liability, allegedly was doing things that the athletic director in two emails recommended he be terminated for, and those recommendations were not acted upon by those in the highest positions of authority. I want to talk about and, these and incidents so, right so, here in front so, of us. So that there was no notice. And again, you're a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, and I'm stuck on this lawyer stuff. Um, that notice is the hallmark of due process. So those, those are the reasons why I didn't fire them. If you all think and the board thinks that they should be fired, the board, my board of supervisors comes and says they should be fired, and I disagree with that, then fire me. But do you disagree with firing them right now? You disagree with firing them still? Yes, I do, because I okay. think they were both put in positions where they, it was impossible for them. They were just to not told, fail. Miriam was told information that she didn't act upon. They were in positions where they could not. Why did you suspend her? Let me work from fail. another angle. Why did you suspend Miriam? I, I suspended her because e even though she was su subject to the authority of the athletic director, the head football coach, the president of the university, she still didn't take any action when Les Miles was, that investigation was occurring. What about these incidents? She, she also reported the, the incident um, involving Darius Geis, but she did not put Darius Geis's name into the report. So okay. because Darius Geis's name wasn't in the report, what that meant is exactly what Ms. Owen said. What that meant was when subsequent events happened, there was no record back to Darius Geis. Miriam says she orally told the person she reported it to that it was Darius Geis, but she didn't put his name into it. And mm -hmm. the person she reported it to didn't put his name into the record. So then what we have is we have a, a record of a terrible, terrible, awful event, mm -hmm. but there's no mention of Darius Geis. So what you just told me is you believe Miriam. I believe Miriam t told 
And, and it's confirmed. No, you that, believe Miriam's side of the story is what you just told. No, me. no, no. There's yes, yes, yes. I believe her on yes, that. Yes. It's in the report. It's in the report. Yeah, you believe Miriam's side of the story because we're hearing another side of the story, with based on the survivors. I I don't I don't think we hear another side of the story. I think we on, are on the Miriam on the Miriam report of Darius Geist, not factually. Hmm. Okay. Are you are you finished, madam? I guess. Senator. I guess. Let me know. If I really don't know back. what else to ask. So let me ask this, Mr. Galligan, because you you made it appear. Oh, it sounds like I hear. Maybe let me phrase it that way. Like they didn't have the they being um, the reporters, the individuals that had received the report. Like they didn't have the wherewithal. Like was there some level of threat to them? I don't know. I don't think there was a threat. I don't think there was a threat to them that was overt. But I think there's a threat to them when your bosses are are telling you to do something and it's inconsistent with what you should be doing or with what the policies say you should be doing. Okay, so let's go there right quick. So they received directives from people that they report to that they had to take a different action? Yeah, the athletic director told people to report to Miriam Seeger. Miriam Seeger's not trained in Title IX as we know it. She's stuck in the middle in an impossible situation, and her boss, the athletic director, has told her to do that. Other folks in this process are, are, are you read the report, probably the most powerful person in the whole state of Louisiana the head football coach of the LSU football team it is allegedly, got to protect ourselves, allegedly doing stuff and nobody's doing terrible stuff and nobody's doing anything about it. And I think Scott Schneider has said, and I don't know if he's still on the line or not, how would this whole world have been different if, some, if, if that matter, the matter involving Coach Miles had been handed, handed differently, handled differently? So they received directives from their bosses that they could not take any action, even though they, I know that they knew they didn't, they didn't need Title IX to tell them that this was wrong. They, they didn't need Title IX, but they were instructed not to take action. So how, how high does that food chain go? I, I can't and how say, many people are I, connected? I can't say that they were instructed, I, I, but I can say that they were working in a system and they were, they were they were they were subject to the the people above them who were supposedly and should have been taking care of business. So this problem is really bigger than we probably even imagined. Because I'm wondering how many more people are there that were are part of this. Because mm -hmm. in my opinion, they are all guilty. They are all a part of this. They have all been a part of the cover up, keeping this silent. And, and so, how many more people are there? I mean, you might not know that, but that that is a question that needs to be answered because if we are going to really begin to address this and we have to address the whole picture we can't just pick out pieces of what we want to address and who we want to um want to reprimand and who we want to fire i mean how far how far up does it go and and you I, don't know and I, <laughs> I can't answer that but what i yeah. can what i can answer is, is that we tried and I'm, it sounds like there's in whether we succeeded or not but we opened the books to, to Hush Blackwell to do a full investigation of, of all of this. And so, so for me, Senator Barrow, our books, our books remain open. Now, there may be instances where we redact, we redact or don't redact in the, the release of a, of a record, but, but I, want our, I want our books to be as open as they can possibly be. Yes, sir. Representative Mazel. Thank you, Madam Chair. You you had a big day. I appreciate everything. You you've been. Thank you. Thank you sincerely. Uh, a couple things, and I, I believe Scott Snyder's still on the phone. Uh, we're and and I would like to better understand why 
certain cases because the impression we have from Hush Blackwell is that these were the only cases that were not resolved. These, this was it. That that are are, are these just the ones that uh, we know we've talked about shining light all day? Are these the only ones that we decided to shine light on through Hush Blackwell? How did Hush Blackwell come to illustrate just these cases? And and and, and can, can I speak? To, I'll speak to that okay, briefly. Scott. Yeah, so um, if, if that's the impression, that's not the impression we're trying to convey in the report. I mean, um, we, we did – the focus of our review initially was there was an article raised about um, – in USA Today that identified a number of cases. And the initial um, inquiry for us okay. was go through these cases – and those included three where there was detailed information, and I think about seven involving um, football players and, and others. And tell us, just be honest with us, tell us what we got right and what we got wrong. And that's what we, that's what we did. That was the starting point. And I can tell you, I mean, I've, I say this in the report, um, there are other people who have said different things and we try to capture this in the report because we feel an obligation to get this right. And I get it. Not everybody. It was the one report I wrote. I said nobody's going to be happy with this. But we tried our darn best to, to tell the, the absolute truth. There was also a piece in our review where the university said to us, and there are tons of files that go back years, and we were also operating on a, on a timeline, go through some of these files and tell us, are the problems you're seeing in these cases, and we identify tons of problems in those cases, do you see them in other cases? And for the most part, we conclude the answer is yes. And there's a section that's brief in the report on that as well. So that was that was our that was our process. Um, to you know, in terms of big picture. Um, I, what we conclude, and I don't know how any other person could conclude otherwise, is that there was a systemic leadership failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, I'll just put this on the table and be honest with you. Um, one of the things we struggled with mightily is you see cases getting to the Title IX coordinator that you go, wow, these aren't being handled appropriately. Should we make a recommendation about the Title IX coordinator specifically. And I will tell you the struggle, and I'm just being honest with you, that we had in that regard, and is what President Galligan uh, referred to a moment ago. I have an office that in 2016 says, and there's a slide, if we don't get resources, President Alexander, um, President, uh, General Counsel Skinner, if we don't get resources, these things that we're now dealing with in 2021 are all going to happen. And they didn't get the resources until 18 months later. So, yeah, there's a part of me that goes, wow, even with all the reporting problems, and there are tons of reporting problems. We outline them in the results. Once it gets to Title IX, Did we have confidence that the, those cases would be handled appropriately? And we say throughout the report, the answer to that question is no. Um, but the, I sit here and I go, am I comfortable saying this is the person that needs to be offered up? Would this person with appropriate resources be able to be successful? And the short answer to that question is I don't know because they've never had them. And, and Scott, on, with that thought, when when I listen to these young ladies, how and and maybe it's in the report I haven't I haven't seen it. How many points of contact did they have with people that took no action on their behalf? I mean, we we've got the two people that are being, um, you know, we're batting them around today. But how many other people? were culpable with being given the information and either shrugging them off or telling them that uh, they were going to ruin somebody else's future? Or uh, Is that in the report? Well, it is. But, again, 
there are some contested facts here that people have, you know, a difference of opinion. It's sort of our job to come in and go, what's more likely to have happened here? And that's, I will tell you, it's harder, especially trying to recreate things that happened five years ago. What you would have loved to have seen is a robust response at the time. Mm -hmm. And that just didn't exist. Um, I will say, I understand um, Jade is critical of, you know, our, uh, the way we outlined how that case was handled. I've been as blunt as humanly possible about the various missteps in our report uh, involving that case. Um, and the same thing, you know, the, the, in Samantha's case, there was a misstep. The misstep was connected to Miriam Seeger because they should not, they should have proceeded to discipline in that case. And had they reported things appropriately, that case may have been very, very um, different. But the outline, I mean, again, it's a 147 page report. We outline it all in there. If the question to me is, is there something that you intentionally hit or that LSU intentionally hit? The answer is absolutely 100%. No way, no how. There's nothing more important to me, and I've done this for a long time, than, than my personal integrity. And the answer to that is, is absolutely not. Were there things that we learned about, including the Les Miles situation, and I'll just be blunt, there was a part of me that went, I don't know that we need to get into this. But it was very clear in talking to people in football operations in the athletic department that that situation set a tone. And when someone told me about the Les Miles situation, I go to the university and I say, I need records. And they say, I don't have records. So is it possible that there's other cases that were handled this way, that they don't have records on site and all that sort of stuff? I can't rule that out. Um, but for us, there was nothing that we were provided to the university, that was provided to us, the university, that I thought, wow, this is a big deal. I'm going to keep it out for a court. Nothing could be further from the truth. Well, I, I, I thank you. I thank you for staying with us at the meeting. But my gut flipped when, when we referred to the head football coach as the most powerful man in Louisiana. That tells us so much of what's wrong with how we perceive it. Hmm. And I, I, I just, I, I believe, Scott, you know, this is not the ending of this meeting will not be the end of this conversation. Absolutely. So uh, uh, I, I well, thank I, you. And I, I want to briefly address that. Mm -hmm. um, look, um, people can say what their values are. Um, at the end of the day, that guy was the highest paid public employee in the state of Louisiana. That's number one. I say this in the report. There are literally more people processing videos in the football operations mm -hmm. than there are that. in the entire university's Title IX office. So we can say whatever it is we prioritize and all that sort of stuff. The proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not new to this. I've done this for a long time. And uh, we might not think he was the most powerful, but there's a lot of evidence suggesting he was. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Madam Pro Tem. Representative uh, Davis. I promise you I'll be really quick. Um, since we brought up um, Coach Les Miles and um, these allegations, and these are still allegations, correct? Nothing has been, it hasn't gone to court, or you know, they're just allegations. And he's no longer employed at LSU, is that correct? That is correct. And so where is he employed now? He was fired. I read it. He was fired. <laughs> Got it. Just curious. Thank you. And, and I guess to add to that, um, he was fired based upon um, maybe not what had actually happened at Kansas. Maybe, perhaps. We don't know that for sure. It's my understanding it was because but, of the, his actions. But they did take immediate his action. Alleged action. His alleged action. Uh -huh. They took immediate action and actually had action following the consequences of something that allegedly happened and they made a decision. They took 
action immediately. Yeah. Immediately. Representative Edmiston. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Snyder, uh, I think there's a possibility that there's some misunderstanding um, amongst a lot of people, but especially us here uh, as legislators trying to sort through all of this. Uh, the report that you were asked to do, um, can I ask you uh, how much uh, the report costs? Yeah, we bill, so we had a contract with the university. This has been public. We did, a, you know, a reduced rate to, to do it, but we billed by the hour, and it's pursuant to a contract with the university. I don't know what the, the final total is, but there's a $100,000 cap. Okay, thank you. I, I think that, that I, I know that I was confused. The report, I thought the report was really supposed to be everything that was in question, but it sounds like it was a lot of information provided to you by LSU. It sounds like you uh, interviewed these two young ladies and the young lady on the telephone, and maybe I'm sure others. Uh, and it sounds also like you sort of, uh, and, and maybe this is what you're supposed to do, I don't know with the report, uh, the way it is, but you kind of decide what's credible and what's not. Is that is that well, correct? Yeah. So what what we did was we interviewed um, a number of survivors. We interviewed a number of third party witnesses. There were people who came to us in confidence um, and asked us to to keep them confidential um, as well. Um, there were a number of discrete questions that the university asked us to weigh in on, one of which, like I said at the beginning, was in these cases, identify errors and then give us some guidance about how do we fix this on a go-forward basis. We did that. Um, there was also a question, and I understand people aren't happy with where we ended up on this, but there were well, excuse me just for one second let me just interrupt i i think sure. maybe the reason is because we all maybe had a different idea of what this report was going to do so obviously as uh senator barrow said we have just skimmed the surface with what we've gotten from you there is much more that we need to discover and find out and uh, investigate and hopefully do something about than what we have in your report. Uh, it seems to me that, that a lot of your report, uh, and, and rightfully so, they ask you to see systemically what was wrong. You said it had been going on for a while. And so you gave recommendations for policy changes. But in terms of really delving into the survivors, uh, th that that had not, that's not been done. I, I I'm going to put, I'm going to politely say I don't agree with that. You don't um, agree with that? I think we in detail, um, and I would ask you to read the report. I think it speaks for itself. We have done our best uh, to convey um, their their accounts. Um, okay. So the, the, within, so let me just ask you, if you don't mind, uh, so the, their discrepancies that they have with you in the report, is that just, what, how, what, how would you square that up? I mean, are they just I'll, wrong? I'll, or you, no, yeah. I'll, I'll, walk, I'll walk through it right now. That's totally fine. Um, in, um, again, in Abby's case, pretty much agree wholeheartedly um, with everything that Abby and her father told me, and I reflect that in the report. Um, that's number one. In Samantha's case, uh, I apologize if there were texts that, you know, we didn't include. There were things that we made decisions about. Is this relevant or not? Um, always can be subject to, to second guessing, but uh, that decision, those decisions rest with me and, and, and me solely. Uh, okay. But in her account, we're, I think, pretty clear that what Darius did was wrong and that the institution's response to that was wrong um, as well. Um, I will say there are people that we meet with on the other side of this 
who tell us, wow, I'm being portrayed in the media as a villain and a really bad person. One of the most complicated parts of this, and it was a discreet question that the university asked us to answer. Was okay. At what point did the well? What point did the cells know about this? Um, and did they fail to report? And we did a thorough investigation of it, and we reached a conclusion that I know not everybody's happy with. Right. But I stand by, and I think we got it right. Okay. So again, I think that there were uh, uh, discrepancies on people's parts of where in thinking discrepancies in thinking on where this report was going to go because obviously uh, there's some things that the survivors feel were not included so again i will just agree with senator barrow we, this is just the beginning uh, i think there's much more to investigate and to find out and i think this is a a major major problem that we have got to get right and we've got to get it right now so thank you for answering Thank you so much, uh, Representative Edmiston, uh, Representative Freeman, and then we have Representative Melinda White, who's been on the line and listening in. Representative Freeman. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is really directed towards uh, Mr. Schneider on the phone. C can you explain to me anything? And I, I feel like I just have an inkling of this information from news articles, but there were reports that I've read about um, that happened back in when Les Miles was still the coach here by Morgan Lewis and Taylor Porter. Now, I'm not an attorney, so I have no idea um, who these firms are, where they are. But were you able to incorporate some of these into the report? And I've read as much as the report as I can, but I, I know that there were studies done and law firms hired um, previous to President Galligan's time. I'm wondering where are those reports and are they included yeah. in here or how, how can we on this committee understand what they say? Because because I I again go back to what I said earlier. This just reeks of an organized crime cover up. I mean, I, I really feel like I'm in the middle of some investigation. As, I, as we turn back more leaves, we're going to find out everybody was covering this up. And it's, it well, disgusts yeah. me for the survivors and the parents and the students who you know, don't, don't feel that they can be here today because they, they're here today. I'm listening to them, even though um, I know it's hard for, for them to all be here physically. I'm listening, and I want to know what, what happened with all those reports. Yeah, we, we do discuss, I think, over the course of about 15 pages. Um, I, I will talk about the specifics. We do discuss the, the Taylor Porter piece of this. Um, it is not a popular thing to do, to tell, to say that a law firm, we think, got it wrong. We say that in the report. We don't think that that matter was handled appropriately. We say so. Um, there were a number of, of reviews done of the university's Title IX program. Some of those were from external consultants. Some of them were from the internal audit. We discuss that the issues that were flagged in those reviews. Okay, and were, my, my, my bigger question here, Mr. Schneider, is were those all released? Are those public? Can we see them? Can the, the people who've made these requests see them? And, and from what I understand, there was some conflict of interest on one of those particular firms because they actually, you know, represented some other, you know, the legal issues for LSU. So I just want to know that that we can all see those reports because the, uh, yeah, I have seen the, them. Where are they? You know, that's that's really yeah, what I'd like it, to know. Yeah, I know LSU has them at this point. And I know, for instance, the Taylor Porter report um, received considerable media attention and there was a lawsuit and, and ultimately it was released as well. Is it, I, is it available I, somewhere online? I mean, you, I guess I see you as the chief investigator of this report, Hush, Hush Blackwell, so that's why I'm asking. Yeah. And maybe maybe I, this question is more directed to uh, Mr. DeCure, but I, I personally feel that this should be, they should be available and so we can really, those of us who are trying to change this culture, can see what was in those reports because something tells me there are a lot more people who knew about this and I'm just horrified. Well, I th we've tried to be as detailed as, as possible. I will, can I speak just briefly to the Morgan Lewis piece? Um, 
you know, this was another challenge. I'm just being honest with you. You know, one of you all have had an extensive conversation about the two people who didn't do reports. Um, and those people are Verge, Osbury, and Miriam Seeger. Um, there was a previous report done by another firm that, in essence, clears them of, of – um, of discipline. And we note that in our report. Uh, be that as it may, we think discipline is, is, is appropriate for the failure to report. But there was a previous report done. Uh, and we discussed this in, in the report. I th- thought it was an error to say that um, those folks shouldn't be warranted, uh, that, that there shouldn't be any discipline. We've said in the report that there should be discipline. Would you would you like to respond to that, Mr. DeCure? His mic is not on. I, I don't know. Oh, okay. <clears throat> wait, wait a minute, Ted, so we can hear you. Maybe the mic is dying. Maybe it needs batteries or something. The battery has died. Okay. Hold on for just a second. Okay. Need a second. The, the report by Taylor Porter has been released publicly. That was the subject of a public records lawsuit. Uh, a judge in the 19th Judicial District redacted basically a few sentences as attorney-client privilege, and that one's available on the Internet. And as I explained to you earlier, we will look at making the Morgan Lewis report available i know i think it's essential that we have all the facts here because what we're 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 all of us you know haven't been able to follow this play by play and we're doing the best we can as we're learning but clearly some there's some gaps in the knowledge yeah and there's some other people who are hiding out yeah so that's that's what's really upsetting me i'll take a hard look at that one this week as i mentioned earlier um i believe most of the claims that gave rise to the initial retaining of Morgan Lewis have prescribed, which would really quelch any issues with attorney-client privilege. We appreciate that. And if if you could get a copy of that to Ms. Honeycutt so she can get it to all the members, we would appreciate that. Um, What we're going to do is transition a little bit. I know that you are on the line, Representative uh, White. And and President Galligan, we're going to ask you to stay there. Uh, I want to thank you two young ladies for coming and giving your testimony. We appreciate your uh, bravery and your courage. Uh, we thank you for being a voice for many that could not even show up or didn't have, maybe just didn't feel comfortable in coming today, but you were their voice as well. Uh, and so we appreciate you and we thank you. And we want you to know that we are taking action. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.